Welcome to the Thursday Lightning Talks. Lightning Talks, if you don't know what they are, are very, very short talks. By short, I mean five minutes. So each of our speakers is going to have five minutes to tell you about something. Um, I'm going to time them. When we get to the one minute left mark, I'm going to indicate that you should start clapping with two fingers. So it's a very quiet clap. And then when we get to the five minute mark, I will indicate that you should start clapping very loudly to tell the speaker that they should get off the stage. And then the next speaker will go. Um, we have six speakers today. No, five speakers today, I can't count. And our first speaker is going to be Bruce Mary, who is presenting a talk called The Amazing Disappearing Import. And your time Lose starts on, yes. now ish. Wait, Kay. wait, wait. And go. Right, afternoon, everyone. So, this is going to be about the Python import system and something that bugged me. Sometimes when you import a package like NumPy, sort of all its sub packages come with it, and you can just say numpy.lib.something. And sometimes that doesn't work. So if you import Tornado, and you try and use one of Tornado's sub packages like tornado.gen, it just isn't there. You have to explicitly import it. And that bugged me, and I wanted to find out why. And one of my colleagues made a package by accident, which where it's even more interesting, where you import something, and then you try and use it, and it tells you it's not there. So what happened to it? I just imported it, and it didn't fail. So I sort of dug under the hood. Uh, what actually happens when you import a package, in particular a sub-module? Well, you, we could actually have a full 45-minute talk on the whole Python import system. It's a whole chapter in the Python manual, and not a short one. But the short version is, if you import foo.bar, it'll load the module foo. Uh, it'll also load foo.bar. And it will set the bar attribute in the foo module to point at the foo bar dot bar module. And finally, in the module where we're importing it, it'll set the name foo, so it binds foo to your name. And you'll notice it's not actually binding foo.bar, it binds foo. And when you use foo.bar, it's actually first going to the package foo and then looking up that attribute that was set in step three. So what that means is if anything ever imports foo.bar, that attribute will be set in module foo. So if you import foo, and anyone, including the internals of foo, imports foo.bar, you will have access to foo.bar. And so the difference there is numpy is some, something inside numpy is importing numpy.lib, but nothing inside tornado is importing tornado.gen. Uh, what the heck was happening with this cat del package? Well, the guy who wrote it um, did some imports inside its init to import various classes from these submodules, but he didn't want the submodules themselves hanging around because they're sort of an implementation detail, so he deleted them. But it does then mean if you try and import catdel.h5 data v3, it goes and it imports it and then promptly deletes itself. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> That does not mean that Neil has more time. He has a little bit more time to set up. I think that's fair. So next, our next speaker is Neil Muller, who is going to be. Punctuation for the end of the previous talk. Is that Mike still on? Hello, testing? Great. Okay. Um, and Neil's five. Why did my thing go? And Neil can start now. Okay. So this is python.org. And if you've ever visited it and actually scrolled down, you'll have noticed the section, or hopefully have noticed the section on upcoming events. Um, this is the Python events calendar. And what came up in conversation last night at dinner was a surprisingly few people, a surprising number of people don't know about it. So python.org maintains two event calendars. This one, which is for conferences like this one, and also an event calendar for um, user groups. You can get a more complete calendar here. 
If you submit um, stuff on the main events calendar, it's also tweeted out. It's available as a Google calendar. It's available by Alcal. It's available in all sorts of ways. But the cool thing and the important thing is you can submit your events to both calendars very, very easily. And you should. And we in Cape Town are very bad about submitting our events because the main organizer, me, is very lazy. But um, that's no excuse for anyone else not to submit your events. Um, submitting events is very simple. You just email to events.python.org. You give the details. They have a nice template with all the details available. Um, it's easy enough to find. Just search for Python events calendar. Um, you, se you set the event. This is actually an email list, so you can also subscribe to it and see what events are submitted. Um, there's a volunteer team um, adding events to the calendar. You can get, um, apply to join that and help out, or you can just watch the events on the events list and uh, see what's going on. And yeah, that's about it. Um, so go out, remember to submit your events, and yeah, thank you. Next up, we have Johann Zietzmann, who will be telling us about Cython writing C integrations to Python. And Johann's five minutes start now. Okay, um, I'd like to tell you about um, in integrating thing, things from outside the Python world into the Cython world without losing your mind. Um, okay, what is Cython? It is a, it's a Python-like language. It's amazingly similar to the Python syntax. Uh, the Cython code that you write is translated to C, and then C, the C code is compiled into a DLL or a .so. So our use case is we have a Fortran library that we use to do some very fancy calculations. We want to access this like any good engineer or scientist should from Python. Um, to do that, you have to write a, a C interface to that so that you can get um, talking to, uh, between them. You can also do the same thing with, uh, with Cython rather than Python, uh, rather than C. Okay, so th um, for this code base that we wrote, the comparison is as follows. Um, in C, just to keep things organized, we had to divide it up into 38 files in, in, on the Cython uh, side. Um, it's only 18 files, lines of code similar, um, a little bit less, and there's more spacing, white space in the, in the um, Cython side. Uh, we've got lots of macros which are very bad stuff on the C side, no macros in Cython. So what does it look like? Uh, the comparison, okay. okay. On the left we have uh, the C code, oh, we had the C code. Um, and on the right is the Cython code. So if you look at it, um, C, lots of macros and uh, data um, conversions, etc. Um, on the Python side, it feels like coming home. Um, it's all the stuff that we lo love about uh, the language. It's nice and clean, uh, much less work. Okay, so. Um, the good and the bad compared to, to the C implementation. Um, the good is uh, you avoid in insanity. Uh, you get maintainability, performance. It's, you have a lot less responsibility in Cython than you would have in C. Um, especially, and that lowers the risk of things like memory leaks and segmentation faults, which I was really good at creating. Um, okay, it, and you've got easy access to the entire, entire Python world from within Cython. Uh, in C, that's m more challenging to, to organize. Um, you can hide away the code because it's compiled if you need to, and it's really quick to get started with. The bad stuff is compilation 
is time consuming so so you do lose some time on that and you also lose platform independence so if you um, operate on multiple platforms you do compile for each of them thanks Next up, we have Simon Cross, who will be talking about what do you get if? And Simon's five minutes start now. So <clears throat> last night at this, just after speakers dinner, some people asked David and I to make a lightning talk. Um, so Dave, get up here. <laughs> Dave hasn't seen the slides yet. Um, since Dave like jokes, likes jokes, what do you get if you combine Python, 0MQ, a Raspberry Pi, direct memory access, 90 meters of LEDs, 120 meters of nylon fabric, an inflatable tube, a bunch of old power supplies, a desert, and, six, and a six-meter aluminum ladder. code is all available on GitHub. Next up, where do you go? Gordon. Next up, we have Gordon Ings, who will be talking to us about time series prediction with Facebook Profit. and we're having some EV equipment excitement. It worked perfectly when he tested it. And Gordon's five minutes start now. Uh, hi. Okay. Uh, I got really excited because I thought I was going to have the most colorful one, but uh, turns out not. Uh, and also, I think that was a really cruel joke to play on all those people on drugs. I mean, guys, come on. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to be talking about something I've actually been working with lately, and it's actually really cool. So I thought it would be nice to share with everyone. Um, I work for the city of Cape Town. And something we've become really interested in is predicting stuff to do with water. Uh, so um, we came across this library, which Facebook Research has recently released, uh, open-sourced. It's called uh, Profit. 
And um, so what it essentially does is very simply predicts time series. So you give it a bunch of some data, and here you go, you've got some dates, and then you've got some volumes, and by the way, this data goes back to the beginning of 2017. Um, and then I've got another data frame, which is just the uh, what we're trying to predict. So I got it. I gave it all the data up until about the 25th of this year, and then I kept the rest of this year's data to use as validation data. And how it actually works is really simple. It's actually completely captured inside this method, and really the exciting stuff is happening here when you instantiate it. Um, one thing that's very nice about it is it's public holidays away. Um, you've got to tell it about you tell it about things like public holidays. Uh, another thing is that it has a lot of flexibility for adding different types of seasonality. So I've added an additional seasonality here, which is just about months, because it turns out city data, the beginnings and ends of months matter a lot, uh, in addition to just stuff that happens during the year. Okay, and then once you've constructed your model, uh, you make some data frames for what you want to predict, and you go predict. And sure enough, um, fire it off and uh, don't worry, this is all just some egregious plotting. And so, for example, if we look at the top complaint types, we get a nice graph like this one. Um, so just to explain very briefly what's going on, the blue stuff, the blue dotted line is the prediction, the y, the, the band around it is our confidence, the red dots are when stuff actually happened, what actually happened, and the green lines are sort of a reasonable heuristic. So the stuff that people are already doing in the city when they're trying to predict this stuff. And uh, you can see it's a little bit all over the place, but this is actually because this is quite a few different types of complaints that the city gets that are sort of uh, being combined together. So it usually works a bit better when you focus in on specific issues. So I'm going to go back to that water issue. Uh, and you can see that a lot more of the red lines are sitting in, or well, the red dots, the red crosses are sitting inside our prediction bands. Um, it does fall apart occasionally too, which is quite interesting. So for example, another very common complaint type is to do with no power. And you can see that that's generally quite an unpredictable event and it's scattered all over the place. And so the model comes out and it's a bit weird and where the data falls within it uh, is a bit weird too. Uh, just before I finish off, uh, one thing that it c it you can also do, which I actually found surprisingly interest useful, is that you can pull apart the prediction and understand the different components of it. So I'm just looking over here. I'm looking at the different components of the uh, water management, uh, the, the, the no water water management device uh, complaint type, which is that if the city has restrict is restricting your water supply and you're complaining because you have no water, um, you'll notice that around July 2017, sorry, the date's got a bit mangled here, uh, that started taking off quite a bit. Um, but you can also see the impact of things like holidays, uh, the monthly seasonality, so towards the beginning of the month, the end of the month, stuff matters. People talk to the city a lot, but in the middle, not so much. Um, and then the year one also is has a very lumpy thing towards the end of the year around summer, because remember, this is a water-related code, so summer matters. And then days of the week, you can hear there's empirical proof that uh, in Cape Town, we're not quite as productive on Fridays as we are on Mondays. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>